morning, everyone. I think we're live. I hope we're live. I'm Stacy Dim. I want to welcome everyone to the Washington State premiere showing of an amazing documentary film, Unseen, How We're Failing Our Parent Caregivers. It's an unfiltered, honest glimpse into the lives of often exhausted and isolated parent caregivers who have children with developmental disabilities, autism, and medically or behaviorally complex children. Again, my name is Stacy Dim, and I'm the executive director at the ARC of Washington State. And I'll be your host for this showing with many, many kudos to Clow and Mosaic, who brought this film to our community's attention and have been the logistical wizards making sure that we could air this film across the state. This is our first showing, uh, so hopefully it all goes well, fingers crossed. Um, a little bit later, you're going to meet our moderator, Luis, Luis Mendoza from the Washington State Fathers Network who will facilitate a panel of parents and researchers talking about how this film's message resonates with our families across Washington. We're here today by webinar. Uh, that means you can see us, but we can't really hear or see you much. But if you have questions or comments, you can place them in the chat or the Q&A and we'll, be all, we'll all be watching for them. And just so we know who's here with us, we're wondering if you might fill out this handy dandy poll that's gonna pop up in a minute. They're kind of fun. I think you'll be able to see the live results. Um, and so in one second, you're gonna see a question pop up on your screen and you can answer the question by checking the box and hitting enter. And you don't have to choose one, you can choose whatever boxes you identify with. So here we go. It says, which one of these which of these categories do you identify with? You can check all that apply. Family caregiver unpaid, family caregiver paid, family of a person with disability, unpaid non-family caregiver, paid non-family caregiver, support professional and or agency representative, self-advocate or person with a disability, friend of a person with a disability, a legislator or other. And we're gonna let that populate and see if we can see what some of the results might be. Uh, Priya, do you have a way to show the the category as it pops up? I, I should once I end the poll, yes. Okay, great. So I can't tell Priya if you think people have populated, but it might be enough time now to see how that goes. Good, you can see the numbers, great. I can't see the numbers. <laughs> um. Let me know when you would like me to end the poll. Yeah, I think if it's starting to slow down, you can go ahead and end the poll. And then if you can see what those numbers are, because I'm not able to see them for some reason, go ahead and tell us, what does it look like? Just a general, oh, there we go. I can see it now. So we have a lot of family members, um, paid and unpaid caregivers, and family of people with disabilities. And actually we have a great deal of support professionals and agency representatives as well. And the one I always like to see, friend of a person with a disability. So thanks everybody for, for doing that so we know who's in the audience. Um, all right, well, before we start the film, we have put together a short montage, a video montage of Washington families who wanted to share their own reflections on raising a child with developmental disabilities. You'll see some of these families on our panels over the next three days of showings. And we're super grateful that they're willing to join us and let us meet their families a little and tell us about their own caregiving journey. Priya, go ahead and launch the Washington Voices video. And I can tell everyone and that everything changes in a heartbeat uh, when that diagnosis is uh, given to the family. My children whom I adore more than anything, both of them, um, needed a functional parent, and I was the only parent that they had. Parenting on one hand, and there's caregiving on the other hand, and those are two separate things. And I think often part of the challenge of having, um, when we think about like disability supports and disability services and how we can support families of kids with disabilities and, and families of people with disabilities of all ages, we often like lump this, this um, family relationship, you know, whether it's the parent or the sibling or whatever it is with this aspect of caregiving. And for us, like, like parenting is a joy. 
um, caregiving is a job. I had called a caregiving agency trying to get a caregiver and they said it takes at least a week to get set up to have an account with that agency. Our agency never offered anything to try to help us. This is my five-year-old Charlie. Can, can you say hi? Hi. Nice to meet you. Okay, bye. See you later. Um, that was Charlie and he um, is autistic and he's five years old and he is thriving in his preschool class. You also run the real risk of having one at least uh, parent drop out of the workforce to be able to give full time care to the child with developmental disabilities. I stopped going to work. I stopped going to school. I had to be back on welfare, even though I didn't want it to go, but I had to in order to spend time with my son in order to also um, do things that I knew if I went to work and went to school, he will not get the attention at daycare or preschools. Um, I ran out wrapped in a towel to bring her back in and, and promised her sister I would never again um, take a shower <laughs> and leave her in charge of her older sister in that way. Um, just an example of what life was like really 24 seven. You know, is, is challenging, especially I think through the pandemic, we've had times when um, we had a shortage of caregivers and the agency had a shortage of caregivers. And I know that's been a challenge across the state and across the country really uh, that um, there's a shortage of, of the workforce and a, a wise person told me a number of years ago that when a one person in your family is developmentally disabled, the entire family is disabled in some fashion. Everything changes. Family relationships, relationships with friends, career aspirations, expectations for your child, your individual freedom and flexibility and all the milestones you, you had envisioned for your child. Oh man, thank you. Thanks to our, our Washington State families who were quite kind enough to share their thoughts and their lived experiences with us. Um, as you can see, families come in a lot of shapes and sizes and diversity of culture, language and supports, but most of all joy. And I think you'll see some of that today. And now as I start to introduce this award-winning documentary film, um, I just wanna to explain a few things to you. Uh, this film is Unseen, How We're Failing Our Parent Caregiver, Caregivers, was produced and directed by Tom and Amanda Dyer. It follows Jess and Ryan Ronnie, a blended family with eight children, including Lucas who has profound disabilities. We hope you'll appreciate what it took for this beautiful family to let us peek into their intimate lives and let all of us experience the world that they live in. This film and the panel discussion that follows will likely bring a variety of emotions to the surface. For many of us, we experience this. You may feel sad or angry or uncomfortable, but please to use these strong emotions as an opportunity to listen and understand so we can advocate together for change. Parent caregivers often report that they feel invisible and isolated. Many have their work lives affected or are unable to work. Many parents have spent decades caring for their child with no supports or a way to plan for a future. Parent, um, we, when we asked families involved in these showings what they hope to share, the, the message was really clear. Our beloved children are not the burden. Failing systems and the lack of help for families are the burden. While these are family stories, they're also true stories of policy failures, gaps in our system and services that do not exist. We as caregivers want you to know that we love parenting our children. We just need some help. These systems are failing not only individuals with disabilities, um, but their families and also the caring professionals who seek to serve and support them because they often experience the moral distress of not having enough help to offer. Our wish is that everyone attending these screenings now, parents and caregivers, professionals, elected officials, self-advocates who experience disabilities and community members will join us in truly hearing 
and believing these stories and will be driven to help us with this change. This film shares the raw truth about the challenges faced by many family caregivers. It is not a film about the lived experiences of individuals with intellectual or disabilities whose truths we also honor. It is a portrayal of the parent experience. So I hope you'll watch with us, let yourself feel what emotions you have, and please carry those emotions forward and partner with us for some real change. Well, thank you for joining us again, everyone. We're back and we want to allow folks just a few minutes to process their thoughts and feelings before we meet our panel of parents and researchers. Just to give everyone a second, we have another poll uh, that might allow people to collect their feelings. And um, again, you don't have to select just one. Go ahead and select whatever box you identify with uh, that might resonate with you after you've seen this documentary. It says, how are you feeling after watching this documentary? Heard and seen? So many conflicting emotions I can't even begin to say. Like there's a lot of work to be done. Ready to advocate for better, more supports for caregivers. Overwhelmed? Uncomfortable? Give me a minute. I need time to process or something else. And Priya, if it looks like things are starting to slow down a little bit, go ahead and pop up the results. I want to thank everybody for their for their input. Um, I'm glad there's a lot of range of emotion here. As you can see, we all bring to this film our own lens and experience, and we may all react differently, take away our own acknowledgement or call to action, or whether that's just feeling seen and heard among others with a similar experience, feeling we can do this another day without feeling alone in this journey. Um, before we move on to our panel today, as a special treat, we have with us one of the directors and producers of the film, Amanda Dyer. Amanda, welcome. Hi there, thanks for having me. Yeah, what a powerful piece. And we're so grateful to have you here to talk with us um, today. We're, we're so curious um, what it was like to make this film, why you made this film, and what impact you think it will have on our community and policymakers. Um, I'm curious, how did, how did you meet this beautiful family and get them so intimately to share their lives? Yeah, that's that's a good question because it all just felt very serendipitous the way it kind of came together. Um, so my husband, Tom, and I are um, not parents or caregivers. So we don't, uh, this wasn't our personal story at all. Um, we actually just were discussing working on a documentary as kind of a collaborative passion project on the side, a creative exercise. Um, and didn't have a topic in mind. And then, I mean, within the next two weeks, I just happened to see a post from, or even a, it was a comment on social media from Jess saying that she thought um, we just, there really was a need for a documentary about caregiving because people just had no idea what goes on behind the scenes. And I didn't know Jess at all. We had like a, an acquaintance in common. So I just happened to see that. Um, I looked her up, you know, that, that keyword caught my attention. I looked her up and realized she lived, you know, maybe like 30 minutes away from us, which is just crazy. Um, so we met up, um, Jess and Ryan just started telling us some stories about their life. And Tom and I, I mean, we just couldn't believe it. Like I said, we, we, we just didn't know. We didn't, we had no idea. Um, and so we thought, you know, well, is this just them or is, is this affect more families? So we interviewed several more families and we heard so many similar things. I mean, all these themes just kept coming up over and over. Um, and that was when we kind of realized that uh, there was real potential for a documentary here to make an impact because part of the, the first step was just that, like us, we, we didn't know. And I'll keep saying that I don't think it's that people don't care. I think it's that a lot of people just don't know. Um, so that first hurdle was how do we pull back that curtain and kind of um, open people's eyes to what the families around you are going through. Wow, that's that's pretty amazing. Um, how did you protect Josh's privacy and understand whether or not he was okay with, or Lucas's uh, privacy? Luke, I'm sorry, yeah. Lucas's privacy, and whether or not he was okay with sharing his story and how involved were the Ronnies in the film decisions? Yeah, that was a, a top concern the entire time. We had many a conversation about you know how best to handle that um, because he couldn't just directly tell us if he was or wasn't okay with it. 
Um, so first of all, we listened to, you know, trusted Jess and Ryan, listened to them. Um, they know Luke and um, I, I know Jess felt very strongly that she felt like he um, would want to be a part of this exercise that is about making things better for all families. Um, and it became, so we, you know, we trusted their judgment on how best to be involved and capture things in a respectful way that honored his privacy as well and the whole family. Um, and honestly, after we were around for a while, we, we kind of started to read some of the cues. Like, um, there were times where we would be there filming and Luke would walk away, go in his room. We took that as a good cue that he was done being a part of things for the day. So, um, we tried to just follow his lead as well as when he was okay being around everything. And then when he didn't want to be, um, so it, it's, it was a very, uh, you know, delicate thing. I think that was one of our biggest challenges the whole time was this is a, it's a nuanced issue with a lot of different factors. Um, and we just had to keep that in mind the whole time to be respectful of everybody involved. Um, and we made some decisions like, um, I think the scene where um, you hear like the screaming and things in the background, that was actually a clip that the family already had that they gave to us. Um, and we just made the decision to just do it on a black screen. And I, with the intention being that it, it's not a, it wasn't about what that particular situation was or anything like that. It was really just to paint the picture of what it's like if you're in an environment where there's always noise and screaming and high stress and anxiety. Um, so it's more about how do we show the, the parent or caregiver experience part of that, um, kind, of, kind of replicate that for a viewer, less about any particulars of a situation and more just about thinking about what that experience would, that high stress situation would be like. Um, so just some decisions like that throughout the whole time that we really um, wrestled with it and got input on from a lot of different people as well. Yeah, it sounds like you got really in tune with the family and yourself being in the We spent a lot of time with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so what do you hope will come from this film? What impact are you hoping for? And what will be the next step, steps for this particular film? Yeah. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, it's already exceeded some of our wildest expectations. We, we really just, I think, didn't, didn't even know what we had on our hands here. Um, so that's, it's been exciting that there's been such a positive reception to it in that caregivers and families and professional medical professionals and others have really rallied around it and see it as a tool that they can use. Um, so we hope that when people watch it, um, that it, it kind of, it raises people's uh, awareness on a couple of different levels. So first of all, if you're, if you're just an individual watching this, we hope people ask the question of, you know, who do I know? that is a caregiver, or maybe I need to open my eyes a little bit and realize that probably some families in my neighborhood are caregivers and I just don't even realize it. Um, and what can I do just as an individual that would make a difference? Um, and then if you, if you're, if you work for an organization or a, a local business or a, a global business and you have employees, you know, there's probably caregivers in your workforce that, you know, are you accommodating them? Are you a caregiver friendly workplace? Um, are you a business that has accommodations for a family with disabilities to come to your location? Um, and then also just on the more macro level, the, the policy level, as we're thinking about what we're voting for, what we're choosing to fund in our public programs, what do we what do we want to be advocating for um, in our communities that would affect families more broadly? Um, so I think re regardless of what where you're coming from to the film, there's something there's some application for everyone to kind of look at and see what comes next for them. Well, we're sure glad that you made this film and we really appreciate you doing that and stopping by today. So thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much. You bet. Okay, now I'd like to turn this event over to our very skilled facilitator, Luis Mendoza and our panelist members. Luis is the executive director of the Washington State Fathers Network. He's listened to hundreds of dads and families tell their stories and talk about the role of fathers in raising a child with disabilities. Um, so Lewis, we're so glad you're here. Please take it away. Thank you for that introduction, Stacy. Uh, as the moderator for today's panel, I want to give you a brief overview of how this is going to work and what we hope to accomplish. Our purpose with this panel uh, session are to reinforce the message of the film that caregivers feel unseen and are lacking crucial supports. Have you hear from diverse local voices to show how this issue affects families across different diagnoses and social and cultural backgrounds within our own state? 
convey clearly that it is not our children or people with disabilities who are the burden, it is the lack of support that is the burden. Put faces and names to real people in our communities, the children and their families who are struggling and unseen, which will help those of you who also feel unseen to know that you are not alone in your struggle. And to call out concrete recommendations for policy changes or supports that would help families like the caregivers you're about to hear from. For those of you that are elected officials, leadership from IDD systems of care, or other decision makers, we want you to hear specific recommendations regarding concerns the film and this panel identify. We have four questions for our caregiver panelists, and each will in turn succinctly answer each question. We also have two researchers on our panel who will briefly tie their work to the support needs of parents and family caregivers. Their research papers can be seen on the Clallam Mosaic website. Uh, and I believe it's been, that website's been posted at least once in the chat, but if it could be posted again, that would be really helpful. And now to get us started, I'd like to introduce today's panel. Joining us today are parent Joy Gaynor, who is a family advocate at Seattle Children's Hospital Autism Center, parent Alex Avena, parent Heather Avena, who is also a member of the Family Voices Committee at Yakima's Children, Children's Village, and the Family Advisory Council at Seattle Children's Hospital. Uh, parent Amy Berkheimer, who works for the Parent to Parent Program in Yakima, parent Whitney Storr, and researchers Haley Starr, who is a recent graduate and researcher from the University of Washington, and Megan Burke, a professor of special education at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, who is also a sibling and parent to individuals with disabilities. To get us started, I'm gonna ask Joy to go first with question number one. And that first question is, please tell us very briefly about your family's caregiving situation and what feelings you have after watching this documentary. Joy, go ahead. Thanks, Lewis. Um, yeah, my name is Joy. I'm a single parent to two daughters who are both young adults now. My oldest daughter, Audrey, is profoundly deaf and autistic with severely limited communication and behaviors that require 24 seven, um, I believe it's defined as line of sight supervision. Um, uh, watching this film made me feel primarily a huge sense of relief um, because this is our family's reality and um, it's really scary to talk about. It feels like people can't handle it. Um, you're afraid people are gonna judge you for telling the truth, that they're gonna think that you don't love your child um, and nothing could be further from the truth. So relief. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Amy, I'm sorry, Alex and Heather, why don't you go, go ahead and uh, answer this question about uh, your caregiving situation and your feelings after the video or after the documentary. Thanks, Lewis. Um, we are Heather and Alex Avena, and we have four children. Um, Ava is our oldest. She's a twin, um, and she has uh, intractable epilepsy, which means that um, her seizures are not controlled well. Um, she also has autism, ADHD, and cognitive delays. Um, so she is also kind of uh, not line of sight, but we need to be within um, either within reach of her or be able to hear her at all times. And as far as feelings after the film, um, you know, it's pretty intense. The film is very intense and raw, and but I feel like it really tells our story. There's a lot of things that we can resonate with. And um, especially, I love how they brought up the family affair, that this, this really is all about the family. It's not just one person. Um, it's what, what we deal with as parent caregivers and then also, you know, as, as siblings as well. Thank you. Uh, Amy, could I have you answer the question now, please? Hi, um, my name is Amy and I'm also known as Eli's mom. Um, my husband and I have a 17 year old son with uh, cerebral palsy. 
he is severely affected by his uh, disability. And so he spends most of his life in a bed. Uh, he has a lot of um, medical issues that we have to deal with each day. And um, it's a lot of caregiving around the clock. And um, we don't have to necessarily have line of sight, but we do have monitors um, a camera and monitors throughout the house so that we can see him and what he's doing and when he needs suctioned and repositioned. Um, watching the video just, yeah, makes me, makes me feel seen, but also makes me feel sad because I know we're not alone, but I feel for every one of us that is going through all of these uh, hard emotions. Daily Thank life. You. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Um, Whitney, I believe uh, it's your turn. Yes. Um, good morning. My name is Whitney. Um, I have I have one son. Um, his name is Malachi. He's four years old. He's very medically complex. Um, he was born with the most severe form of a condition called spina bifida, um, which is an issue with the development of the spine. Um, his hydrocephalus, and he was born with heart defects too. So he has um, a trach and he's ventilator dependent. He has epilepsy. Um, so he requires also 24 hour skilled nursing level care. Um, for us, caregiving though, it, we don't have nursing. Um, it's just uh, me and my, my husband. Um, it's, yeah, yeah, it's just us. Um, so I guess, you know, that's, so much of this film resonated with me. It resonated with our caregiving experience. I thought it was just really um, real and, and honest and um, uh, not shocking uh, because you know so much of what our experience has been has been that survival mode, that fight or flight, um, just living in in panic um, for a lot of what you know we've seen as caregiving. So. Um, I, I think this has done a really good job of, of portraying that experience. Thank you. Thank you all for, for being here uh, and sharing with our audience uh, your experience as caregivers and your reactions to the video, to the film. Um, question number two, we'd like you to talk about some of the specific supports that you wish your family had that would allow everyone in your family to thrive. Let's go around again, starting with Joy. Yeah, it's a great question. So um, my daughter, Audrey, does not live with me anymore. So in some ways, that intense caregiving is behind us. She's in supported living, what's kind of generically known as a group home. Um, and asking for that residential placement when she was 15 years old was the hardest decision I have ever made in my life. Um, but it was life changing for our family. And that is a scarce resource. Lots of families need it and aren't getting it. Um, so one thing I want to say is it, it's, it's not just about, hey, I have more free time now because I'm not caring for my daughter. It's a question of physical and emotional well-being for everybody in the family. Um, Audrey's little sister was experiencing pretty severe mental health issues by the time Audrey moved out. I didn't even know the extent of them until after she was um, away from our home. It took me 18 months to learn how to sleep through the night again because I had not slept longer than two or three hours at a stretch for 15 years. So um, it's crucial. Um, and while she's in supported living and she's well cared for, her basic needs are met, what we would want um, is for her to have a fuller life. And that would mean um, the agencies that serve people like her having um, more training and more staff who are able to meet her needs. Audrey spends too much time at home isolated. Um, we had one supported living situation where I pushed hard against that and asked for more to happen and they fired her. Um, they gave us two weeks notice and told us they wouldn't serve her anymore, which was terrifying because it's very hard to find those spots. So what our family needs is to know that moving forward, um, Audrey will have a place to live where she can fully blossom and enjoy life um, and that that's going to be a safe, stable place for her because um, I'm not always going to be there to make sure that that's happening. Thank you, Joy. Uh, Alex and Heather, why don't you let us know about the specific supports that are needed with, with your family? 
Well, there's so many. I think uh, I think most families there uh, we would need a, a half an hour to talk about this. Um, I I think what would benefit our current situation uh, definitely would be skilled and competent um, caregiving uh, talent. Um, uh, this this video really talked a lot about that, and I really appreciated that because. There's really no incentive uh, for somebody to work with a difficult client. Um, we don't do it uh, in our normal job. We don't have to work with difficult clients, right? So um, if there's no incentive to do it in caregiving for somebody that has medical needs, then, then you know that's never gonna happen to have that quality of care for your child. Um, and without that care, um, the, the parent caregivers, uh, you know, we also, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that people have mentioned that, you know, there's lack of sleep, there's mental health issues for the, for both of us. Uh, we are fortunate that Heather and I get to work on this together. Uh, and sometimes we have to take turns to um, cover the night shift, for example, or guess what? It's my turn to sleep tonight, right? Um, so uh, if, if we, did have the ability to have qualified caregivers uh, come to our home to give us a break. Uh, even at nighttime, which is kind of strange, we would build a special room for them to, to be with our child, or we would do whatever it took to be able to uh, uh, accommodate for that ourselves. We're willing to sacrifice, right? And, um, not being able to be healthy as a parent is very stressful and that just adds right and it's a snowball effect and we are breaking emotionally we are breaking physically so emotional rest um physical rest will allow us as parents to continue on the lifelong trek uh for for the extent of our life for the extent of our daughter's life to be those caregivers that she need, needs, right? So uh, a break for mom and dad or for, for whoever's the primary uh, caregivers, that would go a long ways. And it would, and it would definitely um, improve the quality of life of, of the patient or of the, of the person who needs the care. Caring for the caregivers, who, who does that? Yeah, good question. Um... Thank you for that, those, that information. Uh, Amy, go ahead and tell us about what supports are needed for your family. It's really hard to find caregivers, uh, particularly when you have a child that is incontinent and needs uh, nurse delegated tasks like suctioning and tube feeding. So it adds a barrier to who can take care of our son. And so for me, my biggest quest is to figure out how to create less hurdles for people to become caregivers. Excuse me. My husband and I got about two days of training in the hospital and we were sent home with our baby and equipment and good luck. And we had to learn on the job. It's our child. We loved him. We were going to do anything. People would say, I don't know how you do it. Well, what were my choices? I had to learn. However, we need people that are also willing to learn. And I believe they're out there. I believe there are people that would want to come in and learn to care for my child in the way that I could teach them because I have 17 years experience in how to do these things. But the agencies have the hurdles of this training that they have to go through. The majority of the training that caregivers go through have nothing to do with the tasks that would be done for my child. So they've got to go spend two weeks to do that. Then they have to take a day's worth of training to become nurse delegated. Then a nurse has to come out to delegate the tasks to okay them to put a lotion on my son's stoma or whatever. And that's a lot of extra burden on a person. Maybe they're not great with schooling and testing or whatever things might be required of that training. Um, I just want someone willing to learn to come into my home and let me, let me train them to help us. 
um, I understand that we need to protect our kids and I want background checks and I want people to thoroughly vet an employee, but don't add those extra hurdles, particularly if they have nothing to do with what my child needs. And so with that, um, breaking down some of those barriers, increasing wages so that people do want to do these kinds of jobs that are burnout jobs. I'm burnout and it's my kid and I love him. So I know a person, you know, it's not always a fun job to go to with our son. It's kind of the same thing every day. There's not a lot of variety, but there is downtime. And so we try to create some positive incentives for caregivers just on our own as parents. Um, that's, that's my, my story. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I uh, in talking with families, I often hear them say how Im impressed their friends tell them they are that they're doing all this caregiving. And just like you, they say, well, what other choice do I have? And it's true. Um, and Whitney's agreeing with me and I'm gonna let her go ahead and take, take the question now. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm no doubt we have all heard that one over and over, I'm sure. Um, you know, as as a state, as a country, we we do not do a good job of taking care of um, our kids and and our families and our caregivers, and um, we really truly are failing our caregivers, um, which obviously impacts us and impacts in, impacts the child that we're we're taking care of. And um, I think you know th this film did a really good job of of talking to some of those issues, the the mental health supports. Um, I think that is really crucial and it's it's a huge gap that we see. I think that, you know, every time there is a, a diagnosis given out, they should come with a referral to a therapist for the caregivers. Um, I mean, PTSD, the depression, the anxiety, the panic attacks, all those things that you saw shown and talked about in, in the film are so very real. And just access to mental health supports is, is abysmal. Um, I mean, society wide, but I mean, for caregivers, it's really needed. So I think that would be really um, just a really specific support that would be helpful for, for my family and for, for caregivers in general. Um, I think too, like it, the film showed um, the, the difficulties with employment. Um, in Washington state, parent caregivers of kids under 18 can't be paid for the medical caregiving tasks that they are performing. They're performing skilled nursing level jobs and they can't be paid for it. Um, and that's a big problem. Um, it's a problem for finances. It's a problem for employment when you don't really have a lot of other employment options. So allowing parent caregivers to be play, uh, paid, compensated for the medical tasks they're performing, I think would be really crucial. Um, and then lastly, um, guaranteed access to state Medicaid for children with um, complex medical needs and disabilities without having to jump through hoops, just having that guaranteed access. I think that's a really big misconception um, that a lot of people had, and I know I had it, that when you have a kid with a disability, they, of course, they automatically have access to Medicaid because that's what we want to do. That's, of course, they do. They're kids. They have disabilities. They have access to Medicaid. And you find out real quick that that is not true in order to get the, the state insurance that these, these kids really need. Um, you have to have certain types of disabilities. You have to, you know, wait months and months and months, maybe, just to get it. And I think, um, well, that's just ridiculous and, and sad. And um, I wish that parent caregivers, including my family, didn't have to spend so much time and labor and energy um, trying to fix those systems um, for our kids and, and for other kids. Um, it's, it's sad. Yeah. Um, I wanna thank all of you for talking about those supports that are needed. Uh, I had made a really strong Point with all of you that our time was going to be really tight. So I appreciate the fact that you've all very, been very succinct in your answers. But uh, that's given us a couple of extra minutes. So after listening to each other, uh, does anyone have anything they would like to add to their answer or comment on that someone else said? I could add on yeah. to Whitney's. Sorry, go, Alex. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, Amy, Amy, go ahead, and then we'll give Alex and Heather a, a shot. That access to the supports for your child for Medicaid, et cetera, or um, being able to work with um, a child like that. You know, we as parent caregivers, we need health insurance. Um, and so somebody has to work to get you that insurance. And I think that, that would be a benefit 
um, if the state looked at letting a parent who maybe does have to quit the workforce to stay home for them to be able to qualify for health insurance and not have to have those extreme premiums and it's not very good insurance. And the second piece is um, the, I'm sorry, I'm losing my thought, but um, I've lost my thought, Alex and Heather, go ahead. That's okay, yeah. Uh, Amy, I love you for saying that because that was at the top of our of our mind too. Is you know, uh, I, I think that the parents should be uh, part of the, the child's insurance coverage. Uh, what I wanted to add was that it doesn't just affect our um, the parents. We we take the, the the brunt of of it all, but everything transfers to every member of the family, um, even even pets. They, they are affected by, by a child that has uh, special uh, needs and, and uh, care requirements. Um, and that stress level transfers over to, to the siblings and can affect them tremendously in school and socially. So I would ask definitely that if anybody is listening to uh, consider the rest of the children in that family so that they can um, grow up healthy as well mentally and, and be able to, to be productive in society as well. Yeah, the effect on siblings is, is quite impactful. Uh, but let's move on to, oh, um, Joy, if you don't mind, I'm gonna, we're back on schedule. I'm gonna try to keep us that way. So let's move on to question three. Uh, we've heard many times today that our children are not the burden. Uh, the burden is the lack of services and supports to help families like yours. Please tell us about your child's skills, strengths, and some of the joys of parenting this person. Joy, go ahead. Thanks. Um, it's such a privilege to be on this panel with all the rest of you. I'm just going to slip that in. Um, there's a lot I could say here. Um, top of mind is now that Audrey doesn't live with me, I get to have the pure pleasure of being a parent who visits her and takes her out um, and does things with her. And I'm also kind of the only person who does that. So when talking about the skilled support that she needs, um, I was struck by the fact that all of our um, people that we love need different things. Amy, you talked about, um, medic many of you talked about the medical needs, skilled behavior support in our case. And, you know, it needs to be directed to what, what the client needs. But um, Audrey is, affectionate. Um, she is excited about all the little things that she loves to do, you know, warm chocolate chip cookies, uh, swimming, um, the tallest swings at the park. When I pick her up for an outing, um, she has very few words, but she uses all of them to the hilt to make sure that we're going to go do what she wants to do. Um, so, you know, no can be this, or it can be no, 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 no. She can, she can modulate that um, and really let you know what she wants if you're paying attention. Um, and she has a way of seeing the world with kind of a sense of humor that has um, really changed the way I see things too. And I have one quick anecdote about that. Um, when she was younger and we were trying to build her vocabulary, one word we were trying to teach her was dog, the sign for dog. Every time we saw a dog and there were many in our neighborhood, I would sign it and say, hey, Audrey, see the dog. She never signed it back to me. And one day a little teeny dog went by on a leash and I said, hey, Audrey, look at the dog. And she looked at me and she said, cat. And I thought, yeah, of course, every dog we've been telling her is a dog and she's been in her world thinking those cannot possibly all be the same animal and everybody else is crazy. So, um, and she often opens things up to me that way, um, the way that she sees the world. Yeah, thank you, wonderful story. Uh, Alex and Heather, go ahead and tell us about raising your child. Hi, right, thank you. Um, so Ava is our child. I don't know if I mentioned she's 15 years old, but she she is a free spirit, that's for sure. Um, Ava loves to just be in the moment. Whatever she's doing, she's in that moment. Nobody can rush her. Um, she does things on her own timetable, always. Um, she loves to be outside. She loves nature. She is extremely social. And so um, it's interesting because she'll ask and ask and ask to see friends or cousins or family or go to school. And it's funny because once we're there, 
she doesn't interact with them as much as maybe a typical child would. But to her, that's what it is, that she loves to be around people. And so one thing, you know, we do have some groups that are um, available to us here in Yakima, where we're at, which is great, but a lot of them are way too structured for her. <laughs> and so that's one thing that I would love for her to be able to, you know, as I said, come at her own pace, like come and do some art when she wants. And then if she's not done with art, she can go somewhere else. Or for example, her twin sister plays soccer. She wants to play soccer, but she can't be on a team. I mean, that's just the reality. Like the, the team as we see it, right? So I would love those kind of um, groups to come back for her. Um, what else about Ava? Oh my gosh, she loves nature. <laughs> she loves nature and um, we can be walking and all of a sudden she stops just to see a bug or a flower. She, she does live in the moment um, and, and she sees the good in people. She, she has this ability to not judge, you know, like, like typical child would or, or adults can. She doesn't judge. She's a great judge of character. Um, and she's super random. And we love that she's random. We could be in the car and she'll be like, oh, the, the greenhouse or the red door. Super random things. But she has this internal uh, compass and she knows where she's at at all times. Um, she loves to be a Disney princess and she'll never grow out of that. And, and that kind of is kind of cool because she's always excited about, about music and, and about just being happy, you know, and um, she brings out the best in us for sure. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Amy, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so Eli is nonverbal and has, um, intellectual delays and disability. So um, we don't get a lot out of him. We He has no language. He has no way to say yes or no to answer any questions. He is a happy guy. He's a joy to be around. He's not stressful to be in the room with. Um, I am thankful for some of those things. I, I feel bad for that family that is having that auditory stimulation from him all day in the movie. Um, that is another level that I, I can't imagine. And I, and I feel for them. Um, he loves watching movies. He has two iPads, a TV and an iPod. And they are all placed at different places around his bed. And that is how he makes choices. He can roll around and watch whichever show he likes. We typically have one playing the sound and we know which movies he likes to listen to. And then the others are just playing whatever show we put on. He uh, does let us know if he doesn't like what is being played, he will fuss and cry. And of course, my husband over 17 years have become quite skilled at learning what each vocalization that Eli does make means um, from being a silly, goofy, laughing kid to um, saying, excuse me, I do not like this movie that you're making me watch to uh, discomfort, pain, um, sick, illness type of things. Um, and those are things that take some time to get to know for a kid that's nonverbal. Uh, some people think that he's um, upset when I'm saying, no, he's just being silly and being goofy. And um, and so he's he's a joy in that respect. Um, he's really, really handsome. And so <laughs> um, we we get compliments on that. I think everybody does. I, you know, people are awfully kind to us to compliment our kids. Um, and that feels good when they do that, when they do take the time to reach out to us and make us feel seen. Um, and he is in a wheelchair. He's a wheelchair user. So when we go places, we get a free pass. And I just want to acknowledge that, that some families raising kids with disabilities that look typical um, don't have that. And they are more harshly judged. And uh, the mom in the video that, you know, was crying about going to the grocery store because people are so mean, uh, they don't get it. And, um, and we are thankful for the fact that we roll in and everybody knows something's going on with our kid. And we, we aren't judged as harshly. We are absolutely stared at 
And I still am not used to that 17 years later. And I've had so many situations where I've been in a crowd and felt completely alone because people don't know how to talk to us. And so that is something that I'm always trying to bridge those gaps, but it's exhausting. Yeah, I, I bet it is exhausting. Um, Whitney, why don't you uh, finish up question three for us? Yes. Um, so my son, Malachi, he's, he's a preschooler. Um, he has a huge personality. Um, he He's hilarious. He knows he is hilarious. He plays on it. Um, he loves to joke with us. Um, he pushes boundaries and pushes our buttons like other kids that are, you know, that toddler preschool age. Um, he's super loving and super sweet and loves to be snuggled. Um, and then the next minute he's bouncing off the walls and totally wild. And he, um, he really wants to be independent. He will fight us to be independent. He wants to make his own decisions. He wants to go where he wants to go. Um, he is, um, you know, I, 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 I call him our holy terror. I love that about him. It is my favorite thing about him. He is just so stubborn and motivated to do exactly what he wants in life. And um, that just makes me so happy. I love yeah. that. I love me a stubborn. I love me a stubborn kid. <laughs> Those are all really great stories, and uh, I would love to meet all of those children, all of your children. They sound like they'd be great people to, to get to know. Um, let's move on to question four. Uh, if you would, very briefly, uh, share any wisdom or advice that you might have for families who are just starting out on this journey of caring for a loved one with uh, special health or behavioral needs. And we'll go around the same way we have been. So Joy, kick us off, please. Sure. Um, I've struggled with this one because some of the advice I have is the same advice. Um, and we saw this in the film too, that I received, um, with, and with some, um, uh, resentment maybe <laughs> in the past, um, things like take care of yourself, um, put on the oxygen mask. Um, those are important things, but, um, two things come to mind that were the most important things that were said to me um, when Audrey was little and we just had this diagnosis and the things that stuck with me over the years. Um, one of them was uh, somebody in a support group who said, you know, remember you're on Audrey time now. And what she meant was I couldn't think ahead. I didn't know where things were going to go with Audrey. Um, and there was no way to know. So you know, slow down, dial back, pay attention to what's happening in the moment. And, um, you know, it doesn't mean you're not pushing and supporting her towards goals that you might have for her, um, but you're not gonna be on that same track as the kids <clears throat> in the classroom next door. Um, and it, it is easier if you remember that um, and keep that in mind. And the other thing, and this was always hard for me and hard because in my personality, it's hard for me to ask for help sometimes, but also it's hard to ask for the kind of help that you need. Um, and this came out in the film too, that, um, that our kids need. And, um, but I would say when I was able to ask for help from people who knew our family and to be specific about what that help was gonna mean, um, you know, could I get an hour? Could you take Audrey for an hour? And that does mean that you're gonna have to be completely focused on her entirely for that hour, or she may tear your house apart, right? So like, um, you know, some people did disappear from our lives along the way, but the people that responded to those asks for help have become, um, you know, my closest friends and the most important people that we have around still today and are still in Audrey's life today. So that's my Thank two you. cents. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Alex and Heather, any wisdom or advice that you'd like to share? Um, yeah, so just going along with what Joy said, I think it's really important to find your village. And if there are people that are paying attention to your kid and want to get close to them, like hold on to them <laughs> and um, keep them close to you. Because um, as it's been said, sometimes it's kind of a lonely world. And so it's really nice when you see someone genuinely care for your kid. 
Um, and for those that don't, like like Joy said, some people just kind of drop off. Um, I think it's an opportunity to educate them. And this is kind of what our reality is. Um, um, another thing is when you first get a diagnosis, it's very overwhelming. Um, but if something doesn't sit right with you or you in your gut, you feel like something's off, I feel like something we did not do was ask for a second opinion, ask for a third opinion, um, and trust your gut and ask as many questions as you can. It's okay not to know the answers, um, because our, our kids are complex. So, and that's okay. Um, and then also just become friends with other people in the community that get it, <laughs> um, because they will kind of become your lifeline when things are rough your crying shoulder your crying shoulder and they joy in those little little moments that other people might not understand and so that's been huge for us as well yeah and i think uh lastly is uh don't be too hard on yourself and laugh because if you don't you'll cry <laughs> and if you do cry um just run away for a little bit and come back and then you'll be okay Take your time to cry, but always come back. <laughs> yes, come back. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to resonate with the other people on the panel. So, yeah, thank you. Amy, wisdom or advice on your part? All right, thank you. Um, first, I wanted to say accept help when people offer while they're little. Let people in to your life. You think you can do it all in the beginning. You've got the energy and you're learning and you're loving and you're... Um, feeling empowered because you're taking care of the special kid, but you're going to burn out eventually and you're going to realize you need help. And then people might not be there. Um, it's definitely harder to find people as your kid gets bigger and older. And um, so let those people in, let people get to know your kid so that when, as they grow, there are people that understand them, their language, their communication, um, their needs, how your family works, how things are done. Um, the more people that know your child, the better because you never know what's going to happen. Um, extending on what Joy said about you're on your kid's time all of a sudden, um, you know, when our baby's born, if you have a child that is born with some medical condition and you know immediately, you know, you, you're holding a newborn and you're thinking, what, who's going to take care of them when I die? And most people don't go that far ahead when they have their baby in their arms. And that's an everyday reality for us. And a NICU nurse was kind enough to tell me, if I gave you a map of where you would be in five years or 10 years, you can't handle that today. But your journey along the way is going to prepare you for it. And so just take it a day at a time. And I have appreciated that more than anything I was told in Eli's life. And finally enjoy them when they're little babies all do the same thing and we i i always want families to remember that there is joy that don't let their diagnosis rob you of your babyhood your childhood your you know your kid as a kid um, enjoy those moments as much as you can thank you amy let me wrap it up please yeah um I think, you know, I, I would say the same thing about as Amy about just kind of building up that network of, of support around your, your child and around your family, um, find ways to connect, work to connect with other families very early, um, you know, go to parent support groups, go to, um, you know, other early intervention play groups that, you know, your provider is having, like engage in all of that because it's really important. Um, and again, mental health support, please, please like find a therapist, find something that works for you. Talk to, I don't know, your pastor, whatever it is that, that you go to, to find that type of support, um, for yourself, I think is really critical. You know, if, if it, it's also true that like this impacts your relationships, it impacts your relationships a lot. If you happen to have a partner, if you're married, like Marriage counseling is really great. And it's really great from the very beginning. All of that kind of stuff, of those support systems are really important. So I would say, you know, engage as much as possible with that. Um, and then again, just, you know, finding the joy in, in the day um, as much as possible. Um, you know, it was mentioned in, in the film that it, it, 
they don't plan ahead anymore. And, and that's something that we talk about a lot. Like we really try not to plan ahead because our everything's going to change anyways. So, you know, we can focus on the now. We can focus on what's going on in our lives now and, and we can find our happy today. And I think that's really all we can do in our, in our situation. And it's, um, it's kind of been a, a mental shift, but it's been really positive for us. And thank you all for some really good advice and wisdom, obviously based on some experience that was hard to go through, I'm sure, at certain times. Um, I want to thank all of you for being on our panel, uh, letting us have a little peek into your lives and sharing with, with us your obvious and evident love for your families. So thank you very much for that. I'd like to turn now to the researchers on our panel. Haley and Megan, and ask them, given what you've just heard from these panelists, in what ways does this align with your research around the support needs of parent and family caregivers? And Megan, I'm going to ask you to go first. Sure. So, I mean, I think it, it resonates a lot with what we know with research, both from the movie or, and from um, what we've heard from the panelists, you know, the emphasis on the stress kind of the wear and tear that caregivers experience is definitely well documented in the literature. Another key kind of piece of that is the role that if a child or the family member with a disability has significant maladaptive or problem behaviors, uh, that then also increases parent stress. What I like from the panelists is that you identified other kind of contributors to parent stress going beyond behavior. So whether that's the lack of access to formal supports and services, the amount of time it takes to apply for those services, and also medical issues. And, um, there are lots of things that go beyond behavior to explain what's going on and, and driving parent stress up. So I think, you know, research-wise, we it reinforces what we know and some of the research we've done, and it also underscores the need to do more and to dive deeper and to dive in longitudinally to see how things change across the course of the lifespan of the family in terms of needed supports. Thank you. Haley, let's hear what you have to say. Hi there. So I'm going to begin by introducing myself just a little bit. Um, as Lewis mentioned earlier, I'm a recent graduate from the University of Washington, and in the process of applying to medical school right now. And um, alongside school, I worked part-time as an in-home caregiver or respite caregiver for these families and grew up a friend of people with disabilities. So that's kind of where I operate from. And my research really focused on reliance on community and the disability parent community and learning how to navigate care for newly diagnosed families and really studied the complexity of our Washington state healthcare system and as well as the related systems that affect families' um, success in navigating healthcare. And my research absolutely supported and went along with everything that these parents are talking about. Um, and, you know, really calls for, again, a perception of the state to change for the level of support that these families require. Um, not only do we need things like increased patient navigation and care coordination systems for learning how to move through the healthcare system or other state systems. Um, but we also really need to increase the availability and accessibility of respite care and especially state employed caregivers and how much they get paid. Um, as a respite caregiver, I saw, um, I, I was often paid, offered to be paid three or four times as much um, as a privately employed caregiver as I did from the state. Um, and that's obviously extremely inequitable for families of different financial backgrounds. And, um, you know, it just calls for our state to boost funding and policy and support for respite care. Um, and, and overall, just increasing screening and resources for parent caregiver mental health, um, focusing on boosting nonprofits and disability support organizations. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I think the moral of the story is that as outsiders, including myself, we won't fully understand what any parent um, or a parent and caregiver is going through in raising and caregiving for a developmentally disabled person. Um, so we just need to make room to really listen and we need to encourage our state and our state systems to provide these parents with 
tools um, to not only become empowered advocates for their kids, but get to just parent their kids. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Good information. It's nice to know that this issue of caregiving is being looked at from an academic perspective so that uh, things can be backed up and supported. Um, Again, I would encourage everyone to go to the Clala Mosaic website to read the research papers by our researchers. Um, And again, I just wanna thank all of our panelists for for being here today. Um, And as we wrap up this portion of our time together, um, again, thank you everyone for sharing your stories and your information. Um, I can assure our audience that the amount of time that we gave you to tell your stories and talk about your research uh, is truly inadequate. Uh, given the time that you've uh, spent caregiving or the time that you've been doing research. Uh, So thank you again. Uh, For those of you who are caregivers, I hope that you feel less alone and also more inclined to share with others, especially decision makers, your experience and the supports that you need. If you are a legislator or other decision maker, I hope you'll see this as an important an informative step on your journey to understand what these families experience, the supports that they need, and the changes that you can help drive so that caregivers no longer feel unseen. Thank you for listening. And now I'll turn things back to Stacy. Thanks, Lewis. Uh, what a great panel discussion. And as a sibling myself, I can tell you that Siblings love uh, their family members and will have the longest relationships actually with a person with a disability. Um, Many of my colleagues are siblings and I can tell you we're all interested in the outcomes of these conversations. Um, We're gonna turn now to some advocacy. So what happens now? Where do we go from here? And how do we um, take what we've learned today and put it into action? Um, We have a couple of slides to share with you. Um, This first slide is around what can you do um, as an advocate, parent, um, as an ally or a friend. Um, There are a number of ways within Washington State where you can sign up to receive action emails through your local ARC. Um, Other organizations sometimes share your story with your legislators. So if you can get your story down to just two or three minutes, Um, And just give a summary, like you've heard today, legislators really do want to hear from their constituents and they're much more compelled by relationships with um, people that come to them that are in their district than they are by anything else. So take that time. You can join a local parent or family coalition. Uh, We have several of them around the state that um, Clala Mosaic and the ARC and Fathers Network many of us who are here as sponsors can help you connect to. Um, In November, it's National Family Caregivers Month. So be sure to raise your voice and show your commitments and then learn a little bit more about caregiving policy. Um, And those are things that these sponsoring organizations can certainly help you do. Um, And and then our next slide is really about um, what can happen on a legislative level here in Washington state. We are speaking directly to legislators and policymakers at this point. Um, And there are a couple of basic facts about Washington state that are important to know. We have over 80% of people with developmental disabilities living with their families for most of their lifetime. Families are the primary caregivers. So that's an important message to hear today. We have over 2,100 senior family caregivers who are still caring for their son or daughter, many of them well into their 70s, 80s, and 90s, with no way to plan for their child's future when they can no longer provide care. Nationally, over one in five people have been waiting for services for over 10 years. You've all heard tonight about the economic impacts of caregiving um, when one or more family members drop out of the workforce due to lack of childcare, inappropriate schooling or after school services, lack of adult services, and as aging caregivers reach retirement and they have their own increased care needs. Washington State in particular ranks in the bottom 15 states in the nation in spending on developmental disabilities and spending has gone down in our state by 7% over the last five years. 
we're well below the national average in our fiscal commitment to people with developmental disabilities. We have over 14,000 people on a list who are eligible for services, but are waiting. And we have an increasing number of individuals with developmental disabilities stuck in acute care hospitals and inpatient hospitals because there's nowhere for them to go when they're in crisis or when their families are in crisis. While DDA is tasked with providing services, the Developmental Disabilities Administration, they can only do that when our state legislature commits the funding to allow for a robust system of quality care, residential supports, housing, and permanent forecasting of our needs so that we're always at the front of the budget and not the first to get cut. So our advocacy asks today are that legislators consider um, a caseload forecasting. So we have, that's a weird term. I know for most of us on this call, what is caseload forecasting? <laughs> that is a budgeting tool that our state legislators and our governor uses to set priorities for human services within our state budget. For the first time ever, in November of this year, we have a caseload forecast that's forecasted on the um, federal and state matched Medicaid waivers that give all of us community-based care. Um, those are called waivers because we waive our right to institutional care in order to care for our family members in the community. We want that caseload forecast funded. Um, it will focus on residential and all of the waiver services that have been described here today. We would like to be permanently added to the Caseload Forecast Council. That council covers services like foster care, um, forecasting, education, prisons, aging services. These are all vital human services um, that require a level of priority and a level of protection when we are on hard times in our state. And we're not there. We are not in that council. And that we create a long-term DD housing plan. So that is to ensure that we have enough housing that can support people living in the community. And right now we're in a housing crisis. There is a DD housing study that will be coming out in December that we would like legislators to pay particular attention to um, and ensure that there's a capital budget investment in, in our housing. Um, we have some particular challenges that we won't go through today but that the ARC and the organizations that are listed here today will be talking about a lot in the coming months before our legislative session. Um, okay, that is our ask. And we have um, an ability to answer any number of questions for sure um, as we end this today. We're gonna need all of your advocacy for these changes. So this event came together today with a lot of passion by a number of local Washington organizations that support families raising children with developmental disabilities. I just wanna thank those 14 sponsoring organizations again, and an incredibly very, very special thank you to Clallam Mosaic, Priya Jayateb and Catherine McKinney in particular for spearheading all of the logistics and coordination for this event. If I could give them a clap, I would <laughs> resoundingly. Um, and then we're gonna end our showing today sharing that if you know a parent caregiver in your life, please think about how to just see them. And here are just a few suggestions. Um, and I hope that you'll take those to heart as has been mentioned many times today. Just a simple gesture makes people feel more seen and acknowledged. Um, I probably can't say enough how much we can thank the filmmakers, Tom and Amanda Dyer for bringing the Ronnie story to us, to the Ronnie family for sharing with us, their lives, and most especially to Lucas for letting us get to know him. Um, before we end, we're hopeful that some of you who are still here with us, you might complete our post viewing survey, which should launch on closing this Zoom link. The survey will ask if you wanna be added to our advocacy email list, if you'd like to be added to the unseen documentary email list, if you're interested in contacting your legislators to help improve supports for caregivers in Washington state, and if you answered yes or maybe to the questions above, if you would please provide your name and email address, we'll be in touch with you. So that does it for today. I wanna to thank everyone again for joining us. Bravo to the filmmakers and everyone here today and our panelists and have a great day.